All right, thank you, Katie. Now, so like Katie mentioned, we're going to talk about holiday spices. This is definitely not going to be all the spices we use around. I use this time of year, but kind of hit the biggies today. So we'll go ahead and get started here. So first off, what are spices? Several different ways that these can be defined. For this presentation, this is kind of the definition, definition we're going to use. Spices are going to be coming from the roots, the flowers, the fruits. Typically, they're going to be dried if we're using the fruits. Uh, seeds or bark of plants. These plants that these spices are coming from are native to warm tropical areas. And compared to herbs, spices often have much stronger flavors, much more pungent. So we typically use them in smaller amounts compared to herbs. Herbs, on the other hand, are typically going to be the leaves of plants and they're going to come from more temperate areas. So more kind of Europe, North America, uh, so to speak. The spices, trying to get access to them kind of kicked off the age of exploration when we're talking about European history, trying to find ways to get to particularly Southeast Asia to get access to these spices is what led to that age of exploration, led to Christopher Columbus discovering North America for Europeans. So spices are kind of woven throughout human history. So the first one we're going to talk about today is going to be nutmeg. If you've never smelled it, kind of has a distinctive pungent fragrance. It's kind of a, a sweet taste to it. It's one of those things that you just kind of have to try to really understand. You can't really describe it all that well. It's used to flavor a lot of different types of things. So baked goods, confections, used in meat, making meats and sausages and, and cooking vegetables. This time of year, in addition to desserts and stuff, it's also used frequently in eggnog um, as one of the flavoring. The flavoring comes from dozens of different terpenes and phenol propanoids. These chemicals in the plants is what gives them this flavor. One of those, meristocin, can actually cause hallucinogenic effects if you take enough of it and compared to LSD. So if you do eat too much nutmeg, and we're talking large quantities here, can potentially be poison, but you don't have to worry about that if you're just putting a little bit on your nutmeg and or on in your eggnog and using it to cook with. A little other Kind of random trivia for you here. So you may have heard Connecticut referred to as the nutmeg state, supposedly because colonial traders would carve nutmegs out of ordinary wood and then sell those to unsuspecting customers because nutmeg used to be worth uh, quite a bit of money. One early use of using nutmeg was to take one of the seeds and tuck it under your left armpit before attending a social gathering as a way to attract admirers. So we may not be doing much of that this year, but Hopefully next year, once the COVID situation gets figured out, um, that may be something you can try at your holiday party if you are looking to attract some admirers. So when it comes to nutmeg itself, the actual plant, and this is a tropical evergreen that is native to the Spice Islands, specifically the Malacca's Islands, which we refer to commonly as the Spice Islands. And within those, the Banda Islands, uh, there's about 11 islands um, in this little group. Those islands are where nutmeg is native to. And they've done some archeological research on these islands and they found some ceramic pot shards that are about 3,500 years old that have residue of nutmeg on there. So it's been used by humans for at least 3,500 years. This plant is also grown in Granada in the Caribbean. So often referred to as nutmeg island and actually the flag of Granada has a nutmeg on it. But Indonesia where the Spice Islands are at are still, is still the largest producer of nutmeg worldwide. Nutmeg does have a bit of a dark history with it. So the island inhabitants had traded nutmeg for, for hundreds or thousands of years with different traders. The Portuguese, once they discovered these islands, kind of moved in, invaded, and tried to take over the nutmeg trade because it was worth quite a bit of money. They weren't terribly successful. Eventually, the Dutch moved the Portuguese out, and again, they tried to monopolize that nutmeg trade, and they were actually successful with this. Um, unfortunately, the, the way they went about doing it was not particularly good. There was always kind of hostilities between the islanders and the Dutch. Eventually in 1621, the Dutch massacred the inhabitants of the Banda Islands. It's believed the population went from about 15,000 of these islanders to about one to 2,000 people after this. So they completely, pretty much clearly wiped out the islanders, sold them off to slavery so they could corner the market on nutmeg. Uh, you may have heard that the Dutch traded nutmeg for Manhattan. So the Dutch were able to take over all these Banda Islands, except for the island of Run, where the English or the British had control of that island. The Dutch wanted it. The Dutch did have control of Manhattan, which they called New Amsterdam. So in 1667, they did a swap. So the British gave basically the island of Run to the Dutch, and the Dutch gave Manhattan to the English. So that is how that got swapped. And that allowed the Dutch to have complete control over the nutmeg trade. Nutmeg was only, as it, at that time, was only found 
on these islands. And they were able, they were commonly sell it for a 300% markup. So a lot of people got rather wealthy off of the trade of nutmeg. Now, when it comes to nutmeg, uh, we are actually getting two different spices from this plant. This is the only plant that this is the case. So the nutmeg is going to be coming from the actual seed of the tree. And you can see that in the bottom uh, right of that picture, those kind of tan things. Those are the nutmeg seeds that we're using to grate on, on eggnog or buying the powder of. We also get mace from this, and mace is that red fleshy thing there. That's actually the arrow of the plant. If you're not familiar with an arrow, pomegranates, the part of pomegranates we eat, that reddish fleshy part that's full of the juice, that is the arrow of the pomegranate. So kind of the same thing here, nutmeg and that mace. This is not the mace that you would use for self-defense purposes. That is a more of a pepper extract. The mace has kind of a more mild taste to it compared to nutmeg. And there's, as you can see, there's a lot less mace in these plants. So mace is typically going to be more expensive than nutmeg. You can see in the top left there, that is the picture of the actual fruit. Uh, sometimes those fruit, the husks, will be used to make marmalades and jellies and other sweets, particularly in Malaysia and West Java. But that's usually the, the younger fruits. Now, when it comes to harvesting nutmeg and mace, when those fruits start to split open, that is typically when they're going to be harvested. There's a couple different ways they'll go about doing this. One, they'll harvest them while those fruits are still in the tree. So they'll get long poles that have a blade on them and a bucket underneath, and they'll just cut those fruit down and collect them in that bucket. And they're trying to avoid letting those fruit hit the ground because when they do, you open it up to contamination. Another way is to let those seeds fall from those fruit, fall to the ground, and then go in and collect. It's a lot cheaper to do that that way compared to the, the cutting them down. But the cutting them down, you ha typically, they typically have less losses from spoilage because of that. So once they are harvested, they will be set out to dry, usually in the shells. They'll do this over a slow burning, smoking fire, and this is going to keep the insects down. If they don't have a lot of, of these nuts, they'll lay them out in the sun to dry them. After they're dried, they will remove the seeds from the nut. So that nut, the shell is kind of that darker brown, and they'll remove those seeds. And they can, they'll, they can rattle those uh, nuts, and the, the seed will rattle around. That's kind of when they know they're dried enough. And they'll do the same thing with the mace. They'll dry those before it's processed. Going into growing nutmeg, for all of these, I, I just kind of did a quick internet search for all of these different plants to see how easy it would be to obtain these plants. And I was not able to find anywhere that sells nutmeg. Doesn't mean there's not, I didn't do a really extensive um, or long search, but nothing really popped up right away. So this may not be one, if you really wanna grow it, that you're going to be easy, be able to find real easily. And it's also gonna be somewhat difficult to actually get nutmeg off of these, mainly because these plants are dioecious. So these plants are separate male and female plants. So you have to have minimum of two plants if you wanna get fertilization and get that nut production. So typically in production, they are, they're growing these plants from seeds. And a lot of times they will plant two or three seeds together and then thin those out once they can determine if it's a male or female. Typically it takes six years after planting for those plants to flower. And that's really the only way you can determine if it's a male or female plant. So they'll go through, thin those out. Usually they'll have about 10% males to get real good production. There have been some air layering and approach grafting techniques developed to kind of get around this. Um, reproduction by seed is kind of the, the primary way these are going to be produced. And this tree is relatively slow growing. Again, it's going to take six to seven years before it's mature, before it starts blooming. But they can produce for over 80 years, so it's going to be a long-term crop. If we were to grow these here in Illinois, you're going to be growing these in a pot because they are tropical. You would have to bring them indoors during the winter. Uh, next spice we'll talk about is going to be cinnamon. So use of cinnamon can be traced back 7,000 years. Ancient Egyptians used it in their embalming. And it's used nowadays it's used for a variety of different cooking purposes, different baked goods, breads, desserts, what have you. So when it comes to cinnamon, there's actually about 250 species in this cinnamomum genus, which would be considered cinnamon. And there's really only a handful that we would actually use kind of for food production. And really in the United States, there's only two different species that we use. Uh, again, these are tropical evergreens native to Asia, China, um, Indonesia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, India, and that part of the world. Can reach 30 to 50 feet tall, but typically in production, these are not, these are going to be coppiced. So basically these plants, they're going to allow these plants to grow for a handful of years, cut them off basically at ground level, and then those plants are going to send off a bunch of suckers. That's how they're going to produce them. So they're growing them more as a bush that gets about six to eight feet uh, tall. And for cinnamon, 
uh, the part of the plant that we are using in our cooking and stuff is actually going to be the bark of the plant. So when it comes to harvesting and processing cinnamon, again, they'll go out, they'll cut these smaller branches off. Typically, they're going to harvest these plants every two years, allow them to grow two years, cut those branches off, and let them regrow. A lot of times these cinnamon plants, kind of the economic lifespan where they can get good production out of them is about 10 years. When you think about if you're constantly going in and cutting these plants off, that's kind of taxing on these plants. They'll go out, cut these branches. In that top left picture, you can see there that woman, she's scraping off that outer bark of that plant. Once that bark is scraped off, they will then peel off the inner bark, and that is the part that we're going to eat. So that top picture there, they haven't peeled off that outer bark yet, but you can see them prying off that inner bark. Once that inner bark is pried off, they'll cut that into thinner strips, and they will lay that out to dry. It can be in the shade, it can be in the sun. It just kind of depends on where it's being produced. And as those, as that bark dries up, it'll curl up into quills, which is the technical term for those cinnamon sticks. If you buy those, um, those are called quills. So once those have dried, they will then collect those and process them. Your good long sticks that are in good shape, those will be sold as, again, those cinnamon sticks. If they're broken or if they're short or damaged somehow, that cinnamon will be ground up and sold in a powder form. So when it comes to cinnamon, there's really two main types, at least here in, in the United States, that we're going to use. Uh, the cassia cinnamon, this is going to be uh, the most common one. This is a lot darker, rougher texture, and you can see that those sheets of cinnamon, they're going to be a lot thicker. You know, if you wanted to grind this yourself, it's, it's going to be rather difficult. If you put it in a coffee grinder, it'll destroy the coffee grinder. It's, it's that hard. Um, it does have a more um, intense flavor. And it's cheaper to produce. That's probably why it's the most more predominantly used type because it is cheaper. The Cylon or, or the quote unquote true cinnamon is another type. And you can see here, this is much thinner. When they're producing this, they'll actually lay sheets of that bark on top of each other. So you get quite a few um, of these sheets of bark in a quill, whereas opposed to cassia, you just have one sheet of bark. The Cylon, again, is that thinner. It's a lot much, much more finer texture. So this is one that you could grind up at home a little more easily. Flavor and aroma is, is more mild and delicate, some almost kind of a floral or citrusy notes, is how some people would describe it. So a little bit more expensive. And in some parts of the world, when they talk about cinnamon, they're talking about Cylon, and they will refer to the cinnamon that we typically use, think of in, in the United States as cassia. So if you see cassia, that's the type of cinnamon that we're typically going to be using in the United States. There is some other cinnamon, so Indonesian cinnamon, uh, Saigon cinnamon, and Nepal cinnamon are some of the other types that may be used um, in other places around the world as a seasoning. Cinnamon is one plant that you, uh, you can find for sale online. Uh, so these plants are going to full sun to partial shade. They can tolerate a little bit of shade. Uh, these plants are typically going to be grown from seed or vegetatively propagated. The vegetative propagation is usually by cuttings, layering, or, or dividing the root ball. If you're buying one, it's probably going to be coming from a cutting. Uh, temperature, again, this is a tropical plant, so 60 plus degrees. They also are going to appreciate humid conditions. So again, when we're growing our house plants or other plants, we're wanting to try to mimic that natural environment as best we can. Uh, so preferably 50% or higher humidity. However, they will tolerate lower with little harm to the plants. So that will be good. If we're growing it here in Illinois, because when we think about our indoor humidity during this time of year, it's, it's rather low. They do like a moist but not wet growing media. So this is one you're going to want it to dry out in between watering. So stick your finger in there. Make sure the top of that soil mix has dried out before watering again. Um, and they're going to kind of like an, an acidic growing media. So one recommendation is a half peat moss, half perlite mix when you're growing this. These don't need a tremendous amount of fertilizer. You know, if you were growing this, don't, do, don't go too crazy on the fertilizer. They are sensitive to high salt levels as well. Next one we've got is clove, also referred to as Zanzibar redhead. I have never heard that. I find it interesting maybe because I am a redhead. The major component when it comes to the taste of cloves is going to be eugenol, and that is the kind of the chemical that gives that clove taste. And cloves are, are used a lot in cooking meats, pickling fruit, making syrups, other things like that. And a lot of our a lot of different ethnic cuisines are going to use it, Asian, African, Mediterranean. And it is also a component of pumpkin pie spice, um, if you were a fan of that. I did find some stuff uh, back in the third century BC, Chinese emperors of the Han dynasty would require people who were addressing them to chew on cloves to freshen their breath. So it will also give your breath a, a pleasant smell too, if you want to use them for that. So again, clove, again, is another tropical evergreen. Again, this is, we're going back to the Spice Islands. So the Malacca Islands, this is where this is native to as well. It has 
again, been spread throughout the world. In Africa, there's a lot of production. So Zanzibar, uh, which is part of Tanzania, uh, Madagascar, and Mauritius have large production. Tanzania produces about 80% of the world's cloves nowadays. Again, this is the Spice Islands, so Dutch were involved with this again. So with cloves, they went around and forcibly eradicated any clove tree that they could find, except for on a few islands, again, so they could kind of corner that market and prevent others from accessing the spice and being able to sell it. In the 1700s, other countries were able to get, a, get their hands on it, and they were able to spread it to other islands, and they kind of broke up that Dutch monopoly. Clove gets its name from clavis in Latin, or clau in French, which means nail. When you look at those cloves, you can see how they would get that name. They look like miniature nails. So when it comes to harvesting and processing our, our cloves, you can see here on the left there, they're climbing up into trees in order to get these. And they're picking these cloves, these flowers, before they open. So those buds are kind of swelling. Those flowers, the bases of them are starting to turn red, plus the Zanzibar redhead. And they're picking that before those buds open and, and those petals emerge from that. If they pick too early, obviously those cloves aren't going to be as large. If they pick later, there's a, a drastic drop in that oil content and that flavor of those cloves and, and the value of that particular spice. So they're kind of in that right stage for picking for only a couple of days. And the tree, those flowers don't all get ready at the same time. So they may pick that tree, that same tree, three to eight times in a season, try to get as many of those flowers off of there as they can. So again, they'll, they'll climb up into those trees with bags and they'll pick them and they will then spread them out over mats to dry in the sun. You can see that in that bottom picture there. And they will occasionally rake those to make sure they're getting even drying um, and they're not getting any kind of mold formation in there. Typically, they will dry for about four to six days and those cloves are going to lose about two thirds of their weight over that time. And you know, putting this together, looking for pictures, found a lot of pictures of putting these cloves out on the road to dry, kind of along the road and the sidewalk and stuff. A lot of times, whatever area is available to dry them, they'll use. So when it comes to growing cloves, this is another one that may be a little more difficult to get your hands on, but may be able to find some if you really wanted to grow them. Uh, they're typically going to be propagated by seed. So these clove trees are um, monoecious, so you have both male and female flowers on the same plant, um, and they're self-pollinating. So you only need one plant in order to get clove production. The seeds are planted rather quickly after they are they are harvested because they lose their viability within a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. That viability really starts dro dropping off. And these young plants are going to be slow to grow. And they often need shaded conditions when they're doing that. So they will often grow them intercropped with plants such as banana, cassava, or coconut. And as those clove trees get bigger, they'll then remove those other plants so they can get full sun. The tree, under ideal conditions, will mature in about four years. A lot of times it's more like eight to 10 years after planting before they start getting flower production on them. And that production will go up steadily over 20 to 30 years before it kind of hits peak production. I mean, these trees can live for over 100 years. In fact, they found one that was over 375 years old in Indonesia. Now, one thing about cloves, if you have a dry season, you get a lot more production of these flowers. But that also puts a lot of stress on those plants and can cause some, some issues. So a lot of times when they're growing these, they're looking for deep, fertile soils so that those roots can still have access to water during that dry season. And again, this is another tropical plant, so 65 to 80 degrees. And you'd be moving this indoors if you grow it here in Illinois. And I would be remiss to do a presentation on cloves and not include orange pomandiers. I don't know about all of you, but I've made these before in, in school and stuff like that. And you may have had kids or grandkids or you may, yourself may have made these in school. So basically you're sticking cloves into these oranges, letting that orange dry out and, and using this as a fragrance, kind of like potpourri in a room. Pomandiers basically are, are balls that are made for perfumes, originally carried in a vase or, or something like that around a neck or something, used to protect against infection or pestilence kind of in the Middle Ages. Um, but nowadays we're, we're using oranges and, and decorating our trees and, and stuff like that with these. Also, supposedly if you tie a golden ribbon on a, an orange pomadeer, it can be used as a recovery from charms and witchcraft. So if you get hexed by a witch, you may need to, to make yourself an orange pomadeer and tie a gold ribbon to it. Our next plant is going to be allspice. So you can see here, pimenta is the, the genus name, which is pepper in Spanish. So Spanish explorers in the late 1400s, they mistakenly identified this plant as some sort of pepper because they have this peppercorn type appearance, the dried fruit. So that is where the, the genus name comes from. 
it is called allspice because it's kind of tastes like a, a blend of different spices. Um, it's used uh, quite a bit in Caribbean cuisine where it is native to. It's used in jerk seasoning, mole sauces, marinades, used in pickling. The leaves will also be used similar to bay leaves. Wood pruned from these plants will be used as a fuel for, uh, for barbecues in the Caribbean as well. In the United States, we're primarily using it for desserts but apparently it's also used in Cincinnati style chili to give its distinct aroma and flavor. I have never had Cincinnati style chili, so I, I cannot comment as to what that is like, but if you enjoy that and you're wondering how it gets that taste, apparently it comes from allspice. And in other parts of the world, you may also see allspice referred to as um, Jamaica pepper or Jamaican pepper, as well as pimento. So again, this is another small evergreen tree. Um, it is native to, to the West Indies or the, or the Caribbean, as well as Mexico and Central America. Contrary to some people's beliefs, this is not a mix of spices. The English called it all spice because it has, it smells like a blend of cinnamon, nutmeg, black pepper, and cloves. So that's how it got its name. And again, we're using that um, dried, unripe fruit as the spice from this plant. And Jamaica is going to be the primary exporter of all spice worldwide today. Mexico and Honduras will also have some commercial production of all spice. So again, here's kind of the, the harvesting and processing here. So these fruit are uh, harvested off these trees about three to four months after it is done flowering. That fruit's going to be fully developed, but it's still green. It hasn't started turning color yet. And that's when they're trying to pick these small or overripe berries as they're, as they're processing these. These are going to be picked out because that's going to reduce uh, the quality of that product. And this is another manual process. So they're climbing up in trees. You can see that on the top left there, they'll break off the branches, drop them to the ground. And that bottom left there, and they've got a, a blanket or something laid out, again, to keep those plants off the ground to try to reduce some of the potential contaminants that may come from the ground. And they'll then go through there, pick all those berries off, and they will put them in a bag or they'll put them in heaps and they'll let them ferment for about five days. After that, they'll spread them out on drying floors. And that's that picture on the top right there, that cement pad. Put those out on those pads and let them dry in the sun, typically between five and 10 days, again, kind of depending on the weather conditions. If there is rain coming in, they will cover those fruits to, uh, to keep them dry. And eventually they're on the, on the right-hand side, the bottom right, and that's what those fruit are going to look like when they're dried. So you can see how they would be confused with peppercorns. And they're picking these during the wet season. Some areas will use solar dryers or wood-fired ovens, so to speak, in order to dry these out. So allspice is another one that you can find for sale as plants on different internet websites. Again, this is another full sun tropical plant. Uh, so again, warmer temperatures, 60 plus degrees. When we're growing these indoors during the winter, again, that southern exposure is going to be best. You may need to provide some supplemental lighting as well to make sure you're getting a good 8, 10 hours of sunlight there. And again, they're liking humid conditions. So again, 50% plus humidity is going to be ideal. So clustering plants together using a humidifier or something like that to keep that humidity up. They are also going to like that moist, well-drained soil. So letting these plants dry out a little bit in between waterings is going to be helpful with that. When it comes to fertilizer, using something like a 15-15-15 is going to be good. Growing in a clay pot is also a good idea, to, again, kind of helping with that, that drainage, potential drainage issues. Next up, we have peppermint, and this is one we can actually grow outdoors here in Illinois. Peppermint is another one of these that has a long history. It's been referenced in ancient Egyptian medical texts dating back to 1550 BC. Menthol is the active ingredient that gives peppermint that cold sensation. So that, that menthol actually interacts with the TRPM8 receptor on your skin and your mucosal tissue, so in your mouth. And that's what gives that cooling sensation when you eat stuff with mint. Peppermint is much more potent when compared to spearmint. So the menthol content of peppermint is going to be about 40%, whereas spearmint is about half a percent. So peppermint's going to go a lot go a lot longer way than uh, than spearmint is. And peppermint, you're using this and you make candy canes this time of year. It's used in gum, toothpaste, all kinds of different things. Peppermint is going to be native to Europe. This is an herbaceous perennial. It can survive down to zone three. It is a hybrid, so this is not a not a true species. So this is a hybrid between water mint and spearmint. Uh, peppermint is going to have dark green leaves. It's going to have reddish stems and and purplish flowers. Whereas spearmint, they're going to be lighter green in color and they have their leaves are more sh sharp and pointed and they almost look kind of scaly with all the, the veins in them. And spearmint has white flowers. So that's how you can tell those two plants apart. Peppermint can grow one to three feet tall. And then we're using the leaves of these plants. There are a variety of different cultivars of peppermint available. So you've got stuff like chocolate mint, which is supposed to have flavor reminiscent of chocolate mints. 
Um, I've, I've never eaten this, but that's what they say. And there's um, a lime mint, which is the foliage is supposed to be lime scented. There are some variegated varieties out there as well. So when it comes to growing peppermint or really mints in general, they're going to like full sun and they can tolerate some light shade as well, though. They do like moist soils. So you have an area that's, that's a little on the dry side. Mints may not do as well there as they, as they could possibly do. When it comes to peppermint, these are going to be done by stem or root cutting. And these are a hybrid. They are sterile hybrids. So they do not produce viable seed. So if you want to grow peppermint, you're going to have to be getting buying the actual plants. Other mints like spearmint, we can get seeds for. But that is not the case for peppermint. Peppermint and, and mints in general are going to readily spread, which means they are on the aggressive side. So if you're growing these in a small area, either you're going to have to be, be thinning these out or they can quickly take over an area. So typically, a lot of times these are going to be grown in pots to kind of contain them, grown in raised beds. Find some way to contain these plants so they don't quickly take over your garden. Really like peppermint and you want to take it over, can make a good ground cover, especially in, in a little more moist areas. If you are planting these in the ground, typical spacing is going to be 18 uh, to 24 inches apart. And when it comes to harvesting peppermint, you can harvest individual leaves or entire stems. And these leaves will also dry easily. So putting them in a, an air dryer, putting them in the oven on a real low temperature, maybe just turning on the light, putting them in between paper towels. Or, there's some common ways of doing this. If you're picking stems or bunches, hanging those and letting those dry out as well. If you keep them in water, they'll last for about three to seven days wrapped in plastic and the refrigerator can last for up to a week. So they can last a little bit longer. For me, we, we grow mint in pots and we brought some of those indoors for the winter so we can still harvest some of that mint even in the winter. And then last up for me, uh, we have citrus. So the citrus, again, this is not a herb. Peppermint wasn't a spice. Peppermint's an herb. Citrus also is not one of our spices, but it is one of these plants that some people will associate with the holidays, with, with Christmas and stuff. So, so why are oranges uh, popular at Christmas? You may have gotten oranges in your stocking growing up, or maybe you give them in stockings. I would get them from one of my grandparents in our stockings. And admittedly, you know, kids aren't terribly excited when you get oranges and stuff in your stocking. But there is um, a couple of stories behind why this may be. Centuries ago in Europe, oranges were considered rare and expensive. They're, they were a delicacy. So when commoners were able to get uh, their hands on oranges, that was kind of a big deal. So get, giving somebody a gift of an orange on special occasions meant quite a bit because they were hard to get and they were rather expensive. Another story behind why we may get oranges in our stockings is from St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas morphed into Santa Claus. So legend has it that St. Nicholas learned of three sisters who could not get married because they didn't have enough money for their dowry. So he dropped golden balls down a chimney when they landed in their stockings uh, that were drying by a fire so they would be able to afford this dowry. And then oranges, tangerines, clementines, other citrus are supposed to represent that gold that St. Nicholas gave to those three sisters. Just a couple stories behind why we use oranges at Christmas. I have also heard of people using citrus trees kind of as their Christmas tree. So when it comes to citrus, they are native to Southeast Asia, I and mean, they've been cultivated for over 4,000 years in that part of, of the world. Most of our, our citrus that is cultivated nowadays can be traced back to four ancestral species. So citrus will readily cross with one another. So we've got all kinds of different crosses and stuff here. So kind of the four ancest main ancestral species are going to be citron, pomelo, papita, and mandarin. So crosses between those different plants have led to our sweet orange, our lemons, our limes, our grapefruits, what have you. In the case of, of the holidays, again, our sweet oranges are what we most associate with when it comes to the holidays. For sweet oranges, their parentage, they're about 25% of their DNA comes from pomelo and 75% can be traced back to mandarins. So that's how we ended up with those plants. So with sweet oranges would be stuff like navel oranges, blood oranges, plants like that. Some other cl kind of closely related plants to sweet orange are gonna be stuff like tangerines and clementines. Again, these are native to Southeast Asia. The citrus was introduced into Spain by the Moors in the 10th century. Large scale production took off after that. By the 15th century, it spread into the Mediterranean region. Spanish explorers brought citrus to the Americas. I believe Christopher Columbus planted some in Hispaniola during his second voyage to the New World. And that was then spread to South America, Mexico, and Florida. And then Spanish missionaries took oranges into Arizona and California in the early 1700s. So that's kind of how it's spread worldwide in these subtropical areas. So when you're growing citrus, this again, this is another one we can grow here in Illinois. And we're going to be growing this as a potted plant. We're going to have to bring this indoors during the winter. 
Citrus can tolerate a little bit of freezing temperature for short periods of time, but they're not going to be able to survive outdoors in Illinois. So when we're growing citrus, we want to try to look for dwarf cultivars. Those are going to be much better for pot production than a, than a full-size tree. If you're growing, going to try to grow a citrus from a seed that you got from an orange or a lemon that you ate, it's going to take a long time for that to come into production, and it's not going to be the same as the parent. So you're not going to know what you're going to end up with until that plant starts blooming and producing fruit, and that can take years and years for that to happen. So the citrus that we're going to be buying is going to be grafted onto a rootstock. Lemons and limes are going to be easier to grow indoors. They don't take as long. The fruit doesn't take as long to mature, so that's why they're going to be a little bit easier to care for. So in addition to lemon and lime, some other citrus to look for, citron, kefir lime, eureka lemon, be some, some of the type of citrus to look for if you want to try growing this indoors, especially if you haven't grown citrus before. So citrus, typically we're going to keep these in a 10 to 12 inch pots. Again, if you have a smaller plant, you want to start off smaller and kind of work your way up to those larger pots. Probably need to repot them every, every couple of years in order to get real good production. They're going to like sli slightly acidic, well-drained potting medium. If you go to a nursery and stuff, a lot of times you will find cactus and citrus mix, kind of that same type of soil mix there. They do like moist but not wet soil. So again, letting them dry out a little bit in between waterings. They are going to need full sun, southwest facing windows, providing some supplemental lighting to get them through the winter. They like temperatures between 55 and 85 degrees, typically warmer during the day. They need about a 5 to 10 degree de drop at night in order to induce flowering. So again, indoors, we want six plus hours of sun and making sure we're keeping that humidity up so we don't start getting leaf drop and, and flower drop if they're blooming indoors. And there you can see a picture of that flower. And if you have never smelt a, a flower on a citrus tree, it is, it is an amazing smell. I went to grad school at University of Florida when they had some citrus groves on campus that would typically bloom kind of December, January. So that was always a nice time walking through campus when the citrus was blooming. So when it comes to, to actually getting fruit, um, when do you pick it? So these plants are going to be self-fertile, so they can pollinate themselves. So you only need one plant in order to get fruit production. And these fruit are technically called a, a hesperidium. So this is a specialized type of berry with a leathery rind on it. A little trivia there for you. One of the issues with citrus and picking them is they will not ripen after they are picked. So you have to make sure you're picking them when they're ripe, which can be kind of difficult. You can't really use color as an indication of maturity. It's more you kind of have to pick them and taste them in order to find out if they're mature. One of the reasons why growing limes and lemons are a little bit better for kind of home production where you're not going to get many fruit is that they're still going to be sour when they're immature. It's more the kind of the oranges and stuff that are going to need to sweeten up. Um, it becomes an issue. They will naturally shed some fruit. It could be up to 75% of their fruit. So if you do get some fruit production, they start dropping fruit all of a sudden, don't get too alarmed. That is natural a lot of times. When it comes to actually ripening, lemons and limes can take six to nine months. Oranges can take about a year. So this is going to be kind of a long-term crop. You're going to have to take care of these plants for a while while they have fruit on them in order to get be able to pick that fruit. And it's not uncommon to have plants with fruit and flowers on them at the same time because it does take so long for them to mature. There is a type of citrus you can grow outside in Illinois. It's not a true citrus, but hardier trifoliate orange is hardier to zone five. Um, it has that citrus look. It has fruit that looks like citrus. You can see it has some really nice gnarly looking thorns on there. So if you are somebody who does not like people coming onto your lawn, grow yourself a hedge of this and you will no longer have any issues with people coming into your yard. Trees get about 8 to 15 feet tall and wide. The fruit is edible, but it is incredibly acidic and seedy. So typically people are going to be using this more as an ornamental. They're not going to pick that fruit. If you eat too many of the fruits, you can get, because it is so acidic, you can get severe stomach pains and nausea from eating those. Um, and I did find one person talking about these, make a juice out of this. And they say, take one barrel of water, one barrel of sugar, and one fruit. Just kind of give you the idea of how sour these things are. There is one cultivar, Flying Dragon, which has twisted stems. So if you want an even more unusual looking plant, that would be a cultivar to look for if you want. And one thing I will caution about this is that these plants are considered invasive in some states. So make sure you check with any local regulations. And this is kind of a plant at your own risk type plant. My last slide here before I turn it over to Chris, and we often hear that there is nothing that rhymes with the word orange, but there are actually two words that do. So Blorange, which according to Wikipedia, is a prominent mountain overlooking the valley of the River Usk in Abergavenny, Monmouthshire, Southeast Wales. It is located in the Brecon Bacons National Park and is 1,841 feet tall. And then Sporange is another word that rhymes with orange. So this is just the, the sack where spores are made. So we see this in fungus and moss and ferns and stuff. This is an older term nowadays. We use sporangia or sporangium to refer to the structures. A little more useless trivia for you there. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Well, thank you, Ken. I don't think it would have been a presentation for Ken if he didn't talk about sporanges, so <laughs> sporangulas, <laughs> sporangophiles. I'll request control. I'm also kind of disappointed. My favorite uh, spice wasn't included in here for the holidays, butter. But I <laughs> suppose that's a different presentation. Yes, another presentation for another day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to finish up today, talk about ginger. So Ken could have done uh, a wonderful job presenting on this, but I have been growing ginger for several years now. We've been even getting some grant money to be seeing how well can we grow ginger in Illinois. And I will assure you, it can be grown here in Illinois. This, this is a, a, a pretty, you might feel intimidated by this crop, but trust me, this is something that you can do here at home. Um, pictured on the left is uh, what we had growing at the extension office here in Macomb. And up top, that is a little window uh, uh, planter box that I had at my home this past summer. Uh, you can see I got a little cucumber trained on there as well. You know, you got to utilize what space you have. So when you're growing something like a ginger plant, um, we are going to be harvesting the ginger rhizome. That's what we like to consume. Now, you can also utilize the foliage. You can dry that and use that in teas and things like that. Um, but the ginger rhizome is what we're going to be starting our adventure with. Now, ginger is a tropical crop. So keep in mind, if I had it outside right now, it would be dead. So this is something that you do have to move inside once we start getting cool in the fall time, and we can move it back outside in the spring months. Now, if you want to know how much uh, it's going to cost to get you a seed piece, it's about $8 a pound. And the seed piece is what I'm holding right here in this picture uh, on the left here side of the screen. That's a, the, the rhizome, the root. You know, we, we kind of think of these kind of like potatoes. You know, you, you have seed pieces and there's a little eye. As you can see, the little sprout, that little rhizome is about to push out new vegetative growth, that swollen area. And so that's what we're going to start with. You want to make sure that you're not putting a diseased seed piece in the ground. And now disease is kind of what you're seeing there on the right uh, picture there. It's really spongy, corky. You can even, it's smushy. You can even maybe smell a little bit of fungal rot going on there. So you want to make sure that you avoid stuff like that. We're going to talk about why that disease is such an issue with these here in a bit. To help prevent the spread of disease, you're going to want to be cutting seed pieces with a sterilized knife. So if you usually if you order a seed piece, a pound, you know, that's pretty big. You might want to cut that up to be a bit more in a few different spots or pots around the home. Make sure you sterilize that knife between cuts. You're going to want to make sure that you have growing points or two eyes. Again, we're back to that potato reference here. It is recommended, now this is kind of more looking at a commercial perspective, but to sterilize these seed pieces in a 10% bleach solution. You let them dry, let the cut area cure for a couple days, and then you go ahead and put that in the ground. Now, ginger is a very long season crop. It's tropical, so it requires almost all year long in order to produce something for us to harvest. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually start things a little bit early in the house uh, through pre-sprouting. Now we're going to begin this sort of depends where you're at in the, the country or world. Since we're on a, a webinar here, anyone can be dialing in. Usually where we're at here in Illinois, we're starting about mid-February into March. Uh, we're going to be placing our seed pieces into a soilless potting mix. And then we're going to cover those seed pieces fairly lightly, about an inch. We don't want to uh, sink these deep into a pot or anything. You just want to cover them very lightly with some soil. Typically what I do is I place these in a flat or a, a tray, uh, and then I'll just put another flat on top of that and just keep seeding on top. And because at this point, light is not necessary because we're going to need a lot of time for these seed pieces to sprout. Sometimes it can take four up to six weeks for us to get sprouting with our ginger. And we're going to need to be able to keep this area warm. About 80 degrees is sort of that sweet spot, but 70 to 80 is that range where I try to maintain my ginger seed pieces. Now, why we want to pre-sprout? Well, this gains about a month on the growing season. And so we're actually able to get a little bit better harvest here with our ginger. Now, this is just an images kind of illustrating what I had just described. So there's the seed piece there in my hand, slide one. Now, do you see that window behind my hand? This was my old office uh, here in Macomb. Now, I will say my old office, that window 
on a windy day, my and the, the window would be closed, but papers would be blowing around on my desk. So a little drafty. And so I had to utilize a lot of different methods in order to keep the heat in and, and hold it in. And so actually I had a, a flat, uh, that's a little second picture there. I put pieces of broken tile and sand there to try to build up that thermal mass in order to hold that heat. I would then put my heat mat on there. And then on top of that would be another flat where I placed potting soil, planted my seed piece, and then I flipped another flat over top of that. And you know what? It still was pretty cold. I would monitor the temperature of that flat with a little a soil thermometer or really meat thermometer. So as I, I went through the winter trying to do this, you know, I'd spritz it down with some water. I'd measure the temperature. It's kept getting pretty darn cold with that window. So I would just start piling any clothing, laundry, anything I could do to insulate that. And finally, I was able to maintain that with all my old work shirts piled on top. So uh, you got to do what you can. Now, for a lot of us, you might be starting ginger in just a container, maybe a decorative pot uh, or, or maybe a non-decorative ugly plastic pot like you see here. Uh, but this is more for commercial production. For my sake, I do grow ginger more from the commercial style, so I do use flats, but I do have a couple very nice decorative pots that I keep ginger in year round and I take it outside in the spring and bring it in in the fall. I'm going to be using a soilless potting mix. I'm going to be amending this with slow release fertilizer and we'll talk more about that in a few slides. So let's say if you are growing this and you're using a large pot, like a 15 gallon pot, how much ginger would fit in there? Well, you could put about three seed pieces in there, but we wanna be able to maintain two to three inches apart from each seed piece and also from the side of the container. As these rhizomes grow throughout the growing season, they will interact with each other and they will also come into contact with the side of that pot. So we wanna give them enough room in the soil to be able to grow and spread. If you have a container smaller than 15 gallons, yeah, I probably recommend about one, maybe two seed pieces in there. Now, if you are growing these in containers, keep in mind, we said tropical crop, we're looking at sort of a target temperature of 55 degrees. If it gets under that, we really wanna be moving these inside, uh, uh, maybe move them into the garage or put them in the house, especially if it's gonna be following under 55 degrees. At, at that point, you know, you could take, these could go into the 40s, but then they start suffering cold stress. Uh, and so we don't want to put them in that because that just slows them down even more. So try to keep them in an area above 55 degrees air temperature. So if we look at container grown ginger, how big are they going to get? How much space do you need? And here is the ginger later in the season. This is probably October here in Virginia on the right, or on the left, I'm sorry. And on the right uh, is ginger being grown in fabric pots. Now this is in Hawaii. What they're doing here in Hawaii is they are uh, growing seed pieces, which they're then going to sell and ship to folks, probably mostly in the continental or in the other parts of the United States, and North America. Now, a lot of ginger was actually produced in Hawaii, but they did run into an issue with a soil-borne bacterial wilt disease, which actually really hampered the growth of this crop in Hawaii. So a lot of what happens in Hawaii is done indoors, and as you can see here in like a covered greenhouse structure. Uh, most of the ginger that we have in our big grocery stores these days comes from India. And so from India by way of China into the United States is how most of the ginger winds up in our grocery stores. But you're going to need some space for uh, container grown ginger. It can get tall. You know, uh, a healthy ginger plant it will get up to about waist to shoulder high on me. And so and I'm 5'10". So that these can get to be pretty big and leafy plants. Now, let's say you have a wild hair and you want to try growing these in ground. Well, the way to plant these is you sort of treat them like asparagus. You know, with asparagus, you cut a deep trench, four to six inches deep, and then you would put your asparagus seed pieces in the trench, and then you would slowly build up that soil around it. You do the same thing with ginger. So with ginger, you're going to cut a deep trench, just like asparagus, amend that trench with compost and a slow-release fertilizer. Typically, we see good root development in soils that are, uh, have a high amount of phosphorus, and so that means... It's an extension program, so I'm going to say it, folks. You're going to have to do a soil test to see where you're starting. Now, I 
Couldn't say go out and plant this in, in the yard at the same time that, say, you put your winter greens out. Of course not. So this is something that you're going to be planting once the soil hits a temperature of 55 degrees, and you want to hold that temperature overnight. So you don't want that to d dip below 55 or really 50 degrees for your ginger, or else again, you're going to introduce some cold stress to these plants. Plant seed pieces about five inches apart. You can plant them single, double row, rows. Now, I would definitely say if you really want to get serious about growing ginger, a lot of the other plants that we discussed today, consider some type of season extension device. You know, what's pictured here are high tunnels or hoop houses that people are growing in. And even within those hoop houses, as that picture there in the upper left shows that they put then a low tunnel inside the high tunnel. So one little hoop house inside a big hoop house to try to extend the season and get as big of rhizome as they can. Now, why we cut those deep trenches is we're going to be doing a practice called hilling. Now hilling, again, we're gonna go back to potatoes as an example. Ginger grows up and out, kind of like a potato. So you have to keep adding soil or straw or some material to help cover up those roots that are being exposed as it grows up and out. Ginger does the same thing. So as you can see in the upper right hand photo here, this is the root growing up out of the soil. That is when you need to be hilling it or adding soil over top to block light sunlight from getting there, which then initiates additional root growth. So hilling is something that you're going to be doing uh, whether you're growing in ground or in a pot. So if you're growing in a pot, you might actually plant it a little bit, uh, you know, put a little bit of shallow amount of soil in there and just know that over time, you're going to be adding a little bit more soil, a little bit more soil to that container. You're going to hill about every four to six weeks. Every time you do that, it's a good idea to add a little bit of compost mixed in with that soil. If you're using potting soil, probably a good idea also, you know, again, mix in compost, maybe a slow release fertilizer in with that. And when it comes to fertility and, and fertilizers, ginger is actually a pretty heavy feeder, but it's not very good at taking up those nutrients. And it definitely is not a good competitor with weeds as we found out this year. So we want to use a complete fertilizer, something low, but something complete, you know, so four, six, four, something where all three of those NPK slots are filled. I really like using some type of an organic based fertilizer or a synthetic slow release fertilizer because that means that those slowly release the nutrients and they are available to the ginger as it requires them. And again, fertilize every time you hill. Now I say ginger is a heavy feeder but can't take up nutrients very well. That's because it doesn't produce very many fine root hairs as a lot of our other plants do. But there is one thing that we found out, we grew ginger hydroponically this summer. And I wanna show you this picture right here. So on the left side of your screen is ginger that we pulled out of the ground. On the right side of your screen is ginger that was grown hydroponically. Now I've never seen roots develop so many smaller fine root hairs. Unfortunately, we had to terminate this crop because this was being done at Western Illinois University. They had another research project coming into their hydroponic facility. So we had to terminate the crop, but I would have loved to have seen what would all of these tiny roots have developed into? Would this become just a massive head of ginger roots? Ah, I, I want to try it again and see what we can get. Now, in terms of watering, if you're planting these in the ground, put them on a drip irrigation system. Take the guesswork out of watering and, and just get them on a drip system. Ginger likes consistent watering, but it doesn't like to be sitting in water. Too much water is going to slow growth. Overwatering, however, that's going to be also leaching out nutrients. So that means you're going to be fertilizing more often. Now, Illinois doesn't necessarily have a problem with humidity when it comes to the summer months. But if you do live in a part of the world where you do have low humidity, a misting system is a very good recommendation to kind of keep that humidity up around the canopy of the plants. Now we think of gen the, as this is a, a, a tropical crop, so it must like hot soils. Well, actually it, you know, tropical crops, they like moderated soils. So in, in Illinois, we get freezing cold soils, but then we also in the summer months get really, really hot soils. Uh, and if you're growing in a high tunnel or something, you're going to get super hot soil. So they actually fail to thrive in temperatures over 90 degrees. So afternoon sun, if you're in a hot part here in Illinois, that's probably going to be beneficial to this plant.
Use a soil thermometer to help monitor this. Shade cloth helps. You can dense, uh, increase the spacing, make it more dense so that the canopy closes in and keeps that soil cooler or run your irrigation system a little bit longer. Most of the time as a gardener, you're gonna be harvesting baby ginger. This is gonna be different than the mature ginger we pull out at the grocery store, which has been cured and has that skin on it. Baby ginger or immature ginger doesn't have that waxy skin cuticle developed on it and is not as fibrous as that ginger that you get at the store. So what I do is I pull the baby ginger out of the, my pots that I use and then I just take my grater and I just, you know, wash it off, of course, but then I grate it right into the dish, whatever I'm making from gingerbread to, to a stir fry. You can, you take baby ginger and you just grate it directly into that. You don't need to peel it. However, baby ginger does not keep very long but it will keep for months and months if you just toss it in the freezer and just throw it on the grater whenever you need a little bit of ginger flavor in your dishes. You can save seed. I usually pull ginger out of the ground and then I will pot it up and I will let it go naturally dormant inside, as you can see here. Then as it goes dormant, it'll begin to develop and cure those seed pieces, kind of like what we find in the grocery store. And then I save those and I plant those out or pre-sprout them next February. Not many pests to contend with, however, a soil-borne bacterial wilt, this is a critical pest and this is why we avoid planting any type of ginger root that has any indication or evidence of disease. You can test for this, you cut the surface of the ginger, put it in water. If you see a cloudy material leaking out from uh, your ginger that you're testing, that is the bacterial ooze. You remove that plant, you remove that root system immediately. And this is why we always profess crop rotation is important because these can build up in soils. That was a lot of information. Don't you worry though, if you want to try growing ginger at home, I have made two videos uh, on YouTube at these links here, the same link that you'll find the recording of this presentation, pre-sprouting ginger and then growing and harvesting ginger at Illinois uh, Extension Horticulture YouTube channel. Now, with that, I want to promote our blog, uh, which is we write every week and then we have a podcast, which we also post to every week. Uh, feel free to check those out, subscribe to these. Uh, there's Ken, as he said, he's a redhead. And there's me, I, uh, I'm not a redhead. Um, feel free to get in touch with us if you do have questions.